Welcome back to Radio Boston. I'm Sasha Pfeiffer. And I'm Anthony Brooks. When we think about concentrations of poverty and low-income families living paycheck to paycheck, we tend to think about urban neighborhoods. But a report this week from the Boston Federal Reserve Bank pulls the curtain back on what might be described as the hidden poverty of New England suburbs. Among the findings, one in four families that depend on food stamps live in the suburbs. And here's another finding. Nearly two million people who live outside the region's major cities are living below or close to the poverty line. Making things worse is a shortage of resources in the suburbs, like food pantries and job training and public transportation. The Boston Fed gathered the data from surveys of more than 175 community organizations that provide services to families in need. Joining us now is Anthony Poor. He's Community Development Manager at the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston and one of the authors of the Fed's recent report on suburban poverty. Thanks for joining us. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having us. Also with us is Kylie Mauricio. He's a senior policy analyst with the Boston Fed's Community Development Group. Welcome to you. Thank you very much. So, gentlemen, when we talk about the suburbs, we usually think of places with green lawns, shady trees, nice houses. But your report paints a different kind of picture. Tell me what you found about the challenges that many low-income folks face in the suburbs. Anthony Poor, let me start with you. I think what you described, the green grass, the trees, and so on, all those currently exist. When you look at that, folks think that everything is fine. The reality is everything is going okay, but it could be doing a lot better. And if you pull back that onion a bit, you'll see a, a number of low- and moderate-income families who reside within these suburban communities that are often overlooked for the simple fact they don't reside in what's typically uh, considered low- and moderate-income communities. The reality is that the impoverished are no longer them. Impoverished can now be us. Well, give us some of the facts that kind of uh, tell this story about what's going on out there. What did, what did the report find? So the most striking things from the 175 different service organizations is that over 30% of them didn't even know that there were low- and moderate-income people that they could serve in their community. What struck me wasn't necessarily the 30% said, we don't know or that's not applicable to us, but what struck me is that only five out of the 175 said, you know, more than three-quarters of our communities are in the suburbs. And, I mean, that speaks to the dearth of services that are available to these families struggling in, in, in the suburbs. They face a lot of the same challenges as their as their lower income counterparts in urban or rural areas, but what they lack is access to services. Transportation, safety net programs, uh, all the things that might be more available to low income folks in the cities, for example. Absolutely. And I mean, that arises from just a finite um, amount of resources available to these organizations. And so what they do is they look around and say, you know, where can we have the highest impact? And a lot of times that's in urban neighborhoods where, quite frankly, there's a higher concentration of lower-income families. The consequence of that is that these families in the suburbs often get overlooked. Kylie, let me ask you a question, just just to clarify something for for, for me and, and for our listeners. When we talk about the struggles in the suburbs, are we talking about places, those places with the green lawns, shady streets, nice houses, you know, where people might be living surprisingly close to the poverty line? Or are we also talking about the Lowells, the Lawrences, the, the, the small cities and towns that are not Boston. We're talking about both in this case. I mean, it does capture places like Lowell and Lawrence, which may not be traditionally thought as suburbs. You see these lower-income families everywhere. So as we mentioned, one of the findings of your report is that one in four families that receive food stamps live in the suburbs. So it's a big challenge. That right there, what you mentioned, you know, one in four families that receive food stamps, That's a big deal, Um, and it's not something that a lot of policymakers may realize. You know, um, the study is the first of its kind by the Federal Reserve. There have been similar reports looking at trends in rural and urban poverty. Why haven't the suburbs been examined until now? When you talk about suburban communities, it's counterintuitive. You can't have poverty in these beautiful, green, luscious lawns. Well, the reality is that it exists, and as I said before, This is not an issue of uh, of those people. It is now them has become us. That's Anthony Poor. He's Community Development Manager at the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. Anthony Poor, thank you. You're, You're welcome. And Kylie Mauricio, he's a senior policy analyst with the Boston Fed's Community Development Group. Thank you as well, Kylie. We appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Anthony. And we're going to go deeper now into the problem of suburban poverty with two people who've thought a lot about it. And listeners, we want to hear from you on this. Do you live in one of New England's suburbs? Do you see evidence of growing poverty there? What unique challenges 
to low to moderate income families face in the suburbs. Give us a call at 1-800-423-8255. That's 1-800-423-TALK. And joining us now in the studio is Jen Maceda. She's Senior Vice President of United Way at Tri-County, which serves Middlesex, Norfolk, and Worcester counties. And Jen Maceda, welcome to Radio Boston. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. Also with us is Tiziana Deering. She's joining us from Portland, Maine. She's an Associate Professor and Chair of Macro Practice at Boston College, and her research includes poverty and inequality. And Tiziana, welcome back to Radio Boston to you. Thanks, Anthony. It's good to be back. Yeah. And let me start with you, Tiziana. Were were you surprised by this study from the Federal Reserve? Actually, no. I wasn't surprised by this. We've had data for a while now, in fact, some great data out of the Brookings Institution showing that suburban poverty has been a growing phenomenon at least since the economic downturn in 2008. Hmm. So if this is something we've known about for a number of years, um, why does it feel like a surprise to so many? We even heard, um, you know, one of the researchers there at the, at the Boston Fed saying it's counterintuitive. Well, it's counterintuitive because it's forcing us to look at what our stereotypes and assumptions about what poverty is and who poverty is are. Um, We think that the suburbs are for people of prosperity. We have certain assumptions about what poverty looks like, what poor neighborhoods look like. And it turns out that lots of people can experience economic strain. And this is going to force us to rethink our assumptions. Mm. Um, Jen Maceda, let me come to you. United Way uh, opened a food pantry in Framingham in 2012. What real-life examples do you see when you're at this uh, food pantry? Uh, give, Give us an example of what you see. Yeah, I, I would touch upon um, what Dr. Daring was was talking about, just that it's not a surprise um, to the social service sector within the suburban communities either. Um, for the last um, probably 10 years, there's been a ramping up of the need for services, and unfortunately there hasn't been the resources to um, allow that to happen with social safety net services. So um, just at our fan- food pantry that we opened, um, as you said, Anthony, a couple of years ago now, um, when we opened it, we thought we were going to be able to serve a 1,000 families. And so we built our capacity to, to be able to withstand that and to support that. And um, over the course of the last two years, we've had to expand to almost 4,000 families. And that's just serving the Framingham area for our food pantry. And then we have a congregate meal program as well um, that serves anyone that can arrive at um, our 10 Pearl Street location in Framingham to have a hot meal um, twice a week. Uh, So uh, we see families, young families especially. Uh, We see single male adults with children, and we see a lot of elderly. So um, people are coming in for meals with their families, and uh, it's a different face of poverty, definitely, in in the suburban community. So you touched upon the idea that uh, there are green grasses. Well, um, I I think now there's more of a visibility of this need for additional resources and for this poverty that exists within suburbia. Are the social service agencies, like your own, sort of up to the challenge? Because one of the things we heard from that brief interview with the folks at the Fed is that, um, you know, resources Resources are limited, so um, service organizations tend to look toward the parts of the state and the New England states where the concentrations of poverty are greatest. So that would be the cities. So the suburbs tend to be overlooked. Yeah, I, I think that there are uh, there are enough social services to to place additional resources in to be able to support the need that is that it is expanding every day. We see about 60 new families just within our food pantry So, uh, every week. So um, th- what really needs to happen is a strategic and collaborative sharing of resources and um, more awareness, such as the Brookings Institute resor- research and the, um, the research that has come out now by the Federal Reserve. Those are bringing awareness, and re- research always gives us the validity of an issue. Um, there are enough social services. All they need now, not all, that you know, 
money is very important. So it's cha- it's a challenge for us to make the case that the suburban poverty um, exists mm-hmm. and uh, more resources need to go to those social sectors right now. Uh, Tiziana Deering, I'd love to ask you the same question. What has to happen? And, and sort of is it seemed like the Federal Reserve report out of Boston, out of the Boston Fed was sort of um, it didn't so it wasn't so much a, a set of policy prescriptions. It was like we need to get the word out. This exists out there. Is that enough? I mean, if we get the word out, can do we have the resources to deal with it? Well, we don't have the resources to deal with economic strain, period, in the United mm-hmm. States. Just at the time that we're experiencing, you know, increased strain, and we are still experiencing increased strain post-2008, we're cutting government programs at the state uh, local and federal level. I used to run Catholic Charities for the Archdiocese of Boston, and I can tell you, even then, you know, the strain was constant and there was a downward pressure on funding. What getting the word out does do, though, is begin to destigmatize the idea of poverty in suburban neighborhoods. You know, at 2008, 2009, 2010, you'd hear leaders of parishes or heads of small food pantries talking about families coming in with sort of this, like, hiding as they came in the building because there was this sense that they were you weren't supposed to be experiencing this hardship. Mm. And when we get the word out, we begin to destigmatize, which allows services to be more public, to coordinate coordinate for nonprofits to bring more services into suburban areas, for people to feel more comfortable and prepared to take advantage of those services, and then we got to fund them. The nonprofit sector has always been at the ready. we got to fund them. All right. Tell me a bit, uh, Tiziana, uh, about what's been called SUV poverty, what it is and, and why it's so difficult to get out of. Yeah, so SUV poverty is this phrase um, that you see beginning to emerge around, well, wait a minute, they have a house, they have the big car, there's probably, the big screen TV is always the the big symbol. You know, there's probably a TV in there, and, and now we're seeing poverty, how can that be? Well, anybody who experiences financial hardship knows that your assets change. You experience, you know, a tipping point. Maybe you lose your savings, you lose a job, but you don't go out and immediately sell your assets or give them up, Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. You don't get rid of the house. You don't get rid of the car. You need the house for shelter. You need the car to try to get to the next job. And so we have this sense that people are supposed to give up all these assets as they begin to experience financial strain. That's not even rational. And so then people get surprised by the idea of people who have things but are also experiencing poverty or extreme economic mm. strain. Does that make any sense? Absolutely. makes a lot of sense, and you, you, you articulated it really well. Listeners, we're talking about a recent uh, report from the Boston Fed. came out just yesterday that's sort of putting a spotlight on poverty in the suburbs. We're at 1-800-423-8255 if you'd like to join this conversation. Um, Tiziana and Jen, let's take a couple of calls because we've got some listeners standing by. Jill is calling from Bradford. Jill, you're on the air. Hi. Um, thanks for covering this topic. I think I'm a very good example of exactly what you're talking about. Um, last year, my husband and I, after putting ourselves through graduate school and, and working hard all of our lives, finally purchased a home and, um, and a decent used car. And um, unfortunately, um, like Robin Williams, my husband suffered from extreme depression and he committed suicide in February. And I now have a mortgage that my salary cannot meet, and um, a car payment and student loans and things. And so, from the outside, I, I have this you know gorgeous house and and car and and what appears to be a prosperous life, but really is just one more catastrophe away from disaster. And Jill, the first I, thing I want to say to you is how sorry I am um, f- uh, f- for you, and and thank you for calling in. Um, let me just ask you, though, because one of the things uh, we were talking about is a shortage of services to help possibly people yeah. like you. Are there, are there services there for you? No, no. I mean, I, I have no idea how I'm going to pay the heat this winter. And the reality is that my mortgage payment is the same as a, a decent rental would be. Sure. So it would be folly to, to give up the house, especially how much I've already put into it. You know, but I I don't know how I'm going to pay the heat. Jill, stay on the line a second. My income doesn't meet the, you know, yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt. Stay on the line because actually I wanted to ask Jen, Mas- uh, Jen Maceda to sort of chime in here. What would be your, I don't mean to put you on the spot, Jill's story sounds heartbreaking, but what would oh, be your advice? Um, f- 
first of all, call 211. It's an information or referral system that is a collaboration between all United Ways across Massachusetts. And um, that information line is answered by certified call takers that know every resource, uh, depending on your your non-emergency, but in this situation, it, it is an emergency. Um, uh, you know, I, I would reach out for help. And, I, and as we're talking, um, it's very challenging to overcome that stigma, but it, we are in such crisis within our neighborhoods, within suburbia, that um, people are overcoming it slowly, but they are overcoming it. We're seeing more people come in, um, putting their pride aside and and uh, just reaching out, reaching out for help, just like, uh, you know, anyone that's dealing with depression or any mental health issues, reaching out for help is really essential. So is reaching out for help. And, and that's the thing with suburbia. People in suburbia maybe have not... Um, ever been on a system of support before. So one, they've got to open that door and um, begin the process. And and for people that are already on the system, um, they're knowledgeable of it and and they're aware of the services that are available. But this is a new population that um, hasn't ever had to do this before. So just opening that door is really challenging. But Jill, I hope you do open that door and there are people that are waiting there to help you. Jill, we wish you all the luck in the world and thanks so much for calling. Let's take another call. Sarah is calling from Braintree. Hi, Sarah. You're on the air. Hi. Um, as I said, Sarah from Braintree. Um, I moved to Braintree. I grew up in Dorchester, so I grew up in an urban area. And I uh, went to school, graduated, um, had a pretty good job, and I decided to move to Braintree. Um, I got divorced from my husband, and I bought a small condo. And I wanted to move to Braintree because it was pretty, it was quiet, it was suburban, and it has an excellent school system. So that's where I wanted to raise my daughter, and I was doing a pretty good job raising her by myself in Braintree in my little condo. Then the recession hit, and I lost my job, and Mm. I had to go on unemployment. Um, In the meantime, I was going to nursing school, and but during that time, it got harder and harder to pay the mortgage, to pay the condo fee, to pay the electricity, to pay the phone bill. And, you know, something had to give, and I started to notice that I'm like, I'm buying ramen more often. I'm buying, you know, cheaper things, and Having a nursing background now, I know these are not the things that my child needs to be eating, so I had to go ahead and bite the bullet. And I say bite the bullet because I felt a lot of shame having to go and say I need assistance so that I can feed my child because as an educated person, I felt like I should be able to do this. You Mm -hmm. know, I have, you know, the intellectual resources to be able to support myself and do all of this. And, And as the previous caller said, yeah, if you look at my life from the outside, I was like, wow, she's doing really great. You know, she grew up in the inner city. Look at where she's living now. But then I'm carrying around this inner shame of like, I have to go on food stamps so that. Sarah, I I, I, again, I want to express my sympathy to you and thank you for the call. And, and, and Tiziana Deering, you know, listening to Sarah's story, I've got to imagine that this is fairly typical. That is people who leave the city looking for a, a better life and perhaps a cheaper life and then get clobbered by the recession and then are sort of stuck in the suburbs. Yeah, and I think this is really important. Lots and lots of people have been and are being clobbered by the economy. There is no shame in this. Yeah. It's not that you have to swallow your pride or get over the shame. You shouldn't be ashamed. You don't have to be ashamed. Lots of people have been clobbered by this economy. Yeah. Jobs have not recovered the way we needed them to. People aren't necessarily prepared for the next stage of jobs in the workforce. We don't have small-scale manufacturing to help people work their way back. And this is a real strain. Yeah. John, uh, Jen Massetta, literally 20 seconds that remain, a final thought. Yeah, and I, I wanted to say too that, you know, let's take manufacturing as an example. So manufacturing back in our father's day was manufacturing that that was dirty and it was unclean and manufacturing has made a complete shift in clean environments and very technically savvy and, and a lot of training to be able to um, to execute these, these manufacturing. Um, so social services now are smarter, they're more effective, they're more efficient and you'll walk into a place where there are graduate students that understand that you need food to be able to have a nutritious uh, life. Thank All you. All right. That's Jen Maceda. She's Senior Vice President of United Way at Tri-County, uh, which serves Middlesex, Norfolk, Worcester Counties. Jen Maceda, thank you. Thank you. And Tiziana Deering, Associate Professor and Chair of Macro Practice at BC. Thank you, Professor Deering. Good to have you. Thanks very much. Listeners, stay with us. I'm Radio Bo- I'm <laughs> I'm Anthony Brooks with Sasha Pfeiffer. This is Radio Boston.